السلام عليكم. This presentation is about the dynamics of pharyngeal swallowing, starting from the basics, the generated pressures, the timings, the temporal arrangements, and so on. And then we'll go through how can things go wrong at different levels in pharyngeal swallowing, which form the basis of understanding and interpreting all the investigations of pharyngeal dysphagia and aspiration. Understanding the dynamics of the pharyngeal swallowing involves the study of the timing, the speed, the pressure generated, and the temporal arrangement of various structures in the oral cavity, including the tongue and the palate, the larynx, the pharynx, and other structures in the neck or the chest as well. All these actions are very finely tuned centrally by the CNS after receiving appropriate sensory input about the physical and the chemical properties of the bolus and is translated into actions uh, in the various organs involved in the pharyngeal swallowing. This sums it all. The ultimate aim of the pharyngeal swallowing is to transfer a well-prepared bolus from the oral cavity to the upper part of the esophagus within one second or so without spilling backwards into the oral cavity or spilling upwards into the nasopharynx or down to the larynx. The timeline is shown here. It, the whole process should take a second or so. It is divided into the preparatory stage when the pharynx is reconfigured, it takes 0.4 seconds, and then an 0.6 of the second will be taken for the clearance of the bolus from the pharynx into the upper esophagus. There may be a little bit more of time required in this black column, depending on the bolus physical uh, characters, particularly its volume. The whole process starts with the opening of the a glossopalatal contact, the glossopalatal segment contact and the tongue thrust, followed almost immediately by closure of the velopharyngeal junction. And then, depending on the volume of the bolus, if the volume is less than 10 milliliters or 15 milliliters, it shouldn't take any time at all to start passing through the pharynx. If it's more than 20 milliliters, it may take a little bit longer. And then the final process of clearing the pharynx from the uh, bolus would start by closure of the larynx and by the opening of the upper esophageal sphincter and the uh, nasopharynx would remain closed during this process as well. Now to do this, you need to generate pressure primarily by the tongue base. The tongue base uh, thrust could generate something around 130 millimeters of mercury. This is the prime force for the pharyngeal swallowing. And uh, it's not the pharyngeal pressure it's itself, which is almost half the pressure generated by the tongue that drives the movement of the bolus into the pharynx. And this pressure should generate the uh, enough movement into the bolus to reach the upper esophageal sphincter, which should be relaxed by then, and the re relaxation duration is very short, and the relaxation pressure is also very low. But if the cricopharyngeal sphincter is in a spasm, for example, the pressure could uh, be 240 millimeters of mercury, much higher than the primary pressure generated by the tongue or the pressure generated by the pharynx. So this is the summary of the pharyngeal swallowing dynamics. The um, swallowing dynamics start here when a bolus enters into the oral cavity. It is well prepared by chewing, breaking down the food and mixing it with saliva. The important thing about the oral preparatory phase is that the uh, segment between the base of the tongue and the palate prevents the escape, the premature escape of the bolus into the pharynx. So at this point, the base of the tongue is in contact with the 
soft pallet. Once the uh, bolus is well prepared, the next phase starts, the oral propulsive phase. This starts by the action of the tongue. You could see the tongue uh, changing its shape. The tip of the tongue is now going to go in contact with the heart palate, as you can see it. And then a pressure wave is generated. This is the tip now in contact with the heart palate. And then the uh, base of the tongue comes in contact with the soft palate again, and the hard palate, and the mandible is stabilized. And now the pressure is generated by the base of the tongue, and this pushes the bolus into the pharynx. This oral propulsive phase is very much dependent on the physical properties of the bolus, its volume and texture and temperature and things like this. It's here that the preparation of the pharynx to uh, transfer the bolus is taking a, uh, place with closure of the larynx and the closure of the nasopharynx. But if the pharynx is overwhelmed by a large bolus, like in this uh, condition, then you can see that uh, there's some spill over into the larynx because uh, the, the pharynx was overwhelmed and cannot cope with all the volume of the bolus. In the pharyngeal clearance uh, stage, which takes about 0.6 of a second, the velopharyngeal sphincter should be closed, the larynx is closed, and the bolus is transmitted directly from the base of the tongue into the upper oesophageal sphincter within 0.6 of a second or so. The pressure generated by the base of the tongue is the primary force driving this. And the upper um, esophageal sphincter, the cricopharyngeus, should be relaxed at this stage, and the larynx should be moving upwards and anteriorly to open up the sphincter. And then the final stage of the pharyngeal swallowing is the opening up of the upper esophageal sphincter and the cricopharyngeus. This is actually a two-stage uh, process. It starts with the relaxation of the cricopharyngeus. The cricopharyngeus uh, relaxes first, 0.1 second before the actual opening. Now, if you follow up the bolus in there, if the cricopharyngeus is not relaxed enough, then it, the bolus would just accumulate above the cricopharyngeus as in here. The second stage of the actual opening is the traction on the cricopharyngeus by the upward and superior movement of the larynx, and this opens up the sphincter widely for the bolus to move. So it's a two-stage process, relaxation of the muscle first, and then after 0.1 second, the actual opening by the traction of the larynx anteriorly and superiorly. When there are problems with the pharyngeal normal swallowing, we get patients with pharyngeal dysphagia and aspiration. How common? Uh, quite common, actually. This is a very complicated process, the pharyngeal swallowing, and is very finely tuned with the brain. And in conditions like cerebrovascular accidents, Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, it's not uncommon to see uh, patients with pharyngeal dysphagia or aspiration. Even in uh, elderly patients above the age of 65 or so, whether they are being kept in institutions or at home, the incidence is quite high. You also get problems with pharyngeal dysphagia in the um, tracheostomized patients and in head and neck oncology, and patients who have gastroesophageal reflux, or patients immediately after a general anesthetic. So how can things go wrong with the dynamics of the swallowing? There are the general factors that affect the central integration of the process, like age, stroke, um, neurological problems, or affect the whole process at different levels, like smoking or radiotherapy. And there are the uh, specific local factors affecting either the larynx, the pharynx, the hyoid, or the tongue factors, or patients who have tracheostomy. We'll go through examples of all of these now. Age is an independent factor in the development of pharyngeal dysphagia and aspiration. 
It can also act indirectly by inducing changes in the lingual pressure, for example, or zeostomia or oesophageal motility, sensory changes, uh, the sarcopenia of the muscles involved in the um, uh, swallowing mechanism, the various medications uh, taken more by the elderly, and various neurological problems. Radiotherapy is another independent factor in the development of pharyngeal dysphagia and aspiration, a general factor. Early enough in the first six months, it causes the uh, mucositis, the erythema, and the pain, and also the weakening of the muscle contractions. Uh, you can see that this patient is having an esogastric tube, and there is difficulty in clearing up of the saliva from the pharynx because of these uh, uh, combined factors. But after six months, the uh, fibrosis and scarring starts and continue for the next 10 up to 20 years. There will be uh, scarring and, con and contractures and even stenosis of parts of the pharynx due to the radiotherapy. Smoking is another independent factor. Reflexive pharyngeal swallowing is much reduced in smokers, and the incidence of aspiration is also significantly higher than normal individuals. And then there are the local factors, like factors related to the larynx, if there is loss of sensation of the larynx, for example, or immobility of the vocal folds, or uh, failure of the larynx to move upwards and anteriorly during swallowing to open up the upper esophageal uh, sphincter. All these, uh, uh, all these problems can cause uh, aspiration and can cause difficulty with swallowing. Us. And cricopharyngeal dysfunction can be caused by problems affecting the two stages of the cricopharyngeal opening, either the relaxation of the muscle or the actual opening by the laryngeal traction. Um, you could see here when the bolus reaches the cricopharyngeus, it just accumulates on top of it because of failure of the relaxation of the muscle the timely relaxation of the muscle. So there is pooling of the bolus just above the cricopharyngeus sphincter. The pressure generated by the base of the tongue is the primary force for the propulsion of the bolus into the pharynx. Problems in the tongue either affecting the pressure generated, the movement of the tongue, the anterior part of the tongue should come first in contact with the heart palate, as you can see here, followed by the loading of the bolus into the base of the tongue, and finally the movement of the base of the tongue itself to propel the bolus into the pharynx. Any problems here can cause pharyngeal dysphagia. Problems affecting the integrity of the hyoid bone or the attached muscles, either the supra a hyoid or the infrahyoid can cause also dysphagia. The suprahyoid musculature are the platform on top of which tongue mobility and uh, pressure generation takes place, and the infrahyoid muscles through its attachment to the larynx helps in the traction of the larynx anteriorly and superiorly during the cricopharyngeus opening. Up to two-thirds of the patients who have a tracheostomy tube can have pharyngeal dysphagia and or aspiration, either because of the primary cause for the tracheostomy itself or through the effect of the tracheostomy on fixing the larynx and the lower part of the neck, preventing its elevation and uh, for an anterior displacement during the cricopharyngeus opening, the ineffective cough, the loss of the glottic phasic functions, the reduced laryngeal sensation, or the impaired glottic closure. By this, we come to the end on this presentation on the basics of the dynamics of pharyngeal swallowing. This will form the basis for understanding and interpreting all the investigations 
of pharyngeal dysphagia and aspiration as we go through this in the next presentations. Assalamu alaikum.